Hello, my name is Ugo Panizza. I'm Professor of Economics and PICTE Chair in Finance and Development at the Geneva Graduate Institute. Today I'll be talking about uh, public debt or uh, sovereign debt. So public debt levels are very high uh, in both emerging and developing economies. And uh, so I will, I will discuss how economists think about issues related uh, to sovereign debt. So when we think about uh, sovereign debt or public debt, we uh, usually differentiate uh, domestic debt, which is debt which is owed to residents of the country that issues the debt, and external debt, which is debt which is owed to non-resident. And uh, economists tend to emphasize three elements uh, which are um, which make sovereign debt different from other type of debt. First, uh, decisions are made by policymakers who are not uh, eventually responsible for paying the debt, and this uh, generates incentives to uh, borrow too much or overborrow. The second uh, distinguish distinguishing element of uh, public debt is that countries cannot be forced to repay. And the third distinguishing element is that in principle countries uh, have a lot of resources to service the debt. So sometimes countries default, but people say, well, the countries could have really uh, repaid. Uh, so I will focus on external debt and on the last two elements which really characterize external debt, which is uh, the fact that countries cannot be forced to repay and the, countries that countries, and the fact that countries might have a lot of resources to service their debt. So first, why countries cannot be forced to repay? This is linked to two reasons. Traditionally, it was linked to the concept of sovereign immunity. And so countries are equal at the international level, so one country cannot be sued by another country for failing another obligation. Uh, this reason no longer holds because when countries borrow abroad, they explicitly renounce to their sovereign immunity. However, even without sovereign immunity, sovereign debt contracts are hard to enforce because even if I have a judgment saying country X has to pay me something, uh, this judgment is hard to enforce because most of assets of the country are within the country and therefore I cannot appropriate uh, these assets without uh, you know, declaring war. Uh, and this is clearly often normally and hopefully not done. The second issue is why a lot of resources. People say, well, countries could, in principle, always service their debt because they have a lot of resources in their domestic territory. So somebody said, you know, Argentina defaulted and they said they could not repay their debt. Well, they could have uh, given away, you know, part of their territory. They could have given Patagonia to their creditors. So people say, you know, Greece could have given the Parthenon to their creditor. Uh, clearly, these are uh, I find this reasoning uh, a bit peculiar uh, because it would be a little bit like saying that, you know, if I have a debt and I cannot repay, I could you know, sell one of my organs, which uh, law doesn't allow it, uh, and rightly so. So, but anyway, given these two reasons, uh, lack of enforcement and, in principle, uh, abundant resources, economic models have emphasized, have emphasized willingness to pay rather than ability to pay. And there is this idea that when a country defaults on its uh, external debt, it does so not because it cannot pay, but it does so because it doesn't want to pay. Now, if we, if we think in this way, and we think that countries cannot be forced to pay, and they pay only if they want, then we have to, do, you know, we have to try to understand why they would want to pay. And, you know, as an economist, we think of decision in terms of uh, uh, alternative options and thinking about what are the cost of paying vis-a-vis -vis the cost of not repaying. We know what the cost of paying are, so if I owe you 100 billion, the cost of paying is 100 billion, but then what would be the cost uh, of defaulting? What would be the cost of not paying? And, uh, and economists have emphasized uh, three channels through the which induce countries to repay. One is reputation. I pay because if I don't pay you, I will never be able to borrow again. I will have a bad reputation in the international credit market. Uh, economists have also emphasized the fact that countries pay because if they don't pay, they might not be able to trade with the rest of the world. 
And then there are more general reasons based that not paying is bad for your economy, so you pay uh, to protect your economy. And uh, in this cost, when we think about models with willingness to pay, this cost of defaults are really important because, you know, if the cost of default were to be very small, well, then country would be willing to repay only a very small amount and creditors would anticipate this and would lend very little because they would know that as soon as the stock of debt is above this cost of payment, countries would not be willing to repay. Now, there, there is an issue with these explanations based uh, on cost of repaying. Uh, and, and the issue is that, number one, empirically, it's very hard to estimate this cost of defaults. And second, when we try to estimate quantitative models of sovereign debt, the most commonly used uh, explanation for the cost of default, which is this reputational effect, yields costs which are very, very small. It costs that uh, could let country to be able to borrow about 1%, 2% of their own GDP, which is clearly uh, much less than what we observe. Another problem with this explanation that this models based on willingness to repay kind of made us think of countries as willing uh, to rush to default. As soon as there is a problem, I say, well, it's better not to pay than repay. But actually what we observe in the real world is that uh, countries normally default too late. That is, uh, after uh, the point at which it would, be, would have been optimal from society's point of view of default. In fact, there is a famous uh, paper by the International Monetary Fund which states uh, that restructurings have often been too little and too late, which is sort of uh, reverse this view that uh, countries would like to default. Why might countries want to pay uh, even when uh, there is uh, you know, very uh, low likelihood that their debt is sustainable? And my, this might be for purely political reasons. Uh, politicians tend to lose their job uh, when they default. Politicians that default are unlikely to be able uh, to have a career uh, after brought a, having brought a country to default. So, so politicians might be willing uh, to try to repay even when it would be good to default to protect their own interest rather than to uh, protect the interest uh, of these countries. Another uh, implication of this uh, approach, which focuses on um, limited commitment, it focuses on the fact that uh, countries would like to default and don't, they don't default only because default is costly, is that uh, any policy which tries to make the default process uh, working in a better way any uh, policy that tries to reduce the cost of default uh, would be inefficient ex ante because it would reduce the cost of default and thus would reduce willingness to pay and thus would reduce a uh, country's ability to access the international credit market. So there have been all these proposals for reforming the international uh, financial architecture and for having uh, a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism and people have criticized this proposal by saying, no, no, this would hurt countries because it would generate uh, too little willingness to repay. But maybe we can think about the problem in a different way. Maybe we can build theoretical models which assume that countries always want to repay and they default only if something very bad happened today to them. And uh, building this theoretical model is complicated from a mathematical point of view. But we have done some uh, progress along these lines in a, in a recent paper with Fabrice Collard, Michel Habib, and Jean-Charles Rocher. And one interesting thing that we find, we find that when we assume willingness to repay, the result that uh, having a well-working uh, default mechanism uh, is inefficient ex ante gets completely reversed. And in fact, having a well-working mechanism that reduces the cost of default actually is good for the countries, both ex ante, because it allows them to borrow more, and of course, ex post, because it reduces the cost of default once the default happens.